Halloween. Red <laughs> hair. <laughs> there you, you go. used to have red hair? No, shit. I used to have hair. <laughs> Now, Len, you, you worked with athletes in the NHL. You've worked with hundreds of athletes between your academic practices and any private things you've done. What, in your opinion, are the major contributors to athletic performance? The, most of the sports I've been involved with are uh, team sports. Sure. And probably the single most important attribute that we don't train is decision-making. Sure. And making quick and accurate decisions. Uh, we'll definitely agree with you there. Now, obviously, physical skills cannot be ignored. What do you think is the mix of, um, in terms of your success, what do you think is the mix of physical skills compared to mental skills? That uh, what, percent, what percent of success is physical and what percent is mental? Oh, I think it's very difficult to give it an exact or very sure. precise percentage breakdown. Um, you, you hear this all the time uh, that, you know, in a game like golf to say, you know, it's 90% uh, mental, 10% physical, and you hear these kind of thrown around all the time. I found it very difficult to put a, put a value on it, but it's a, it's a true mind-body interaction. And uh, we spend most of our time training athletes physically, very little systematic mental training. And I think now we're at the point in 2012 where we can simultaneously train the body and the mind to optimize performance. Definitely. Now, what are some of the techniques and tools you have at your disposal uh, to do that exact training you mentioned? Well, uh, I think historically uh, we didn't have the technology in very primitive kinds of ways to uh, enhance decision making speed, uh, simple re reaction type of devices. Uh, paper and pencil things to look at focus and concentration uh, but that's old stuff now and what the younger generation wants uh, they're typically computer based technology they're, they're savvy with it they appreciate it they, they're constantly playing games well this is more than a game uh, the things that we're trying to do now is, it's, it's, it's beyond games it's systematic training of skill acquisition Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, transfers directly to the sport that they're playing. Sure. Can you give an example from your experience of uh, uh, some type of program that you've developed? Not that I've personally developed, but sure. certainly um, when I was in Vancouver, we brought in, we were perhaps the first in pro hockey, I know we were the first in pro hockey, to bring in the Cognizant system. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what's interesting is the players, what, one of the first things they'd ask, or the coach is more likely to ask, what is the transferability of this, the work we're doing in the cave with what's going to happen on the ice. Right. And uh, in a matter of months, I could show them the data that people who trained the most were the best decision makers on the ice. So we'd ask the coach, so who are the best decision makers? Without priming them yeah. by letting them know. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Well, now let's, let's take, take a look at the data now. And so there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between the players who who spent most of the time, more of the time in the cave training on the speed of decision making and accuracy of decision making with their accuracy on the ice. That's uh, so incredible. you can't provide better evidence than that. <laughs> so, and I think that would be true in soccer, mm -hmm. that would be true in basketball, um, that uh, people who are willing to commit themselves to training speed and accuracy of decision making are going to be better. Mm -hmm. What sort of, uh, what sort of uh, techniques Training techniques would you combine with the NeuroTracker uh, when you when you were doing the training with the Canucks? Well, you you want to increase the workload, right? And so one of the things I experimented with is just having them handling a puck on our, kind of an artificial ice yeah. uh, in, in the cave, so that they're essentially at least dual processing, so that they're handling the puck and uh, and trying to make decisions and. Uh, about the, the ball movement, you know, tracking on. What was your experience? How um how big a debt or how big a distraction is that simple puck handling? Oh, it's, it is it is pretty significant. You know, if you're just doing kind of the lateral mm -hmm. side to side, but then you start having them do figure eights, <laughs> things that they're you know really gifted at, but not with your now they're but they're tracking at the same time. So it's 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 uh, increasing workload, and they're not going to be as good, but that's. You know what you have to do. That's the world of 
training and support, you've got to increase the resistance. No question about that. Now, uh, some of the or some players have definitely thought that NeuroTracker is vision training or eye training. Uh, have you ever had to to address that concern? Well, sure. I try to dispel that sure. because I'm pretty familiar with the vision training and, and, the, and the people who do vision training and I'm familiar with the scientific evidence that it, it, it is at best modest, modest kinds of improvement. Like uh, you, can, you can only improve visual acuity so much. Right, right. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, but your ability to track moving objects can improve with practice. Yeah. So it's... It's a whole central nervous system processing system. Yeah, vision's a big part of it, but it's not vision training. Right. A lot of people say NeuroTracker is overly simple. Uh, it's just bouncing yellow balls in a cube. Do, do you ever have to address concerns of transferability from the athletes? Uh, no, I think they, they understand uh, that uh, you get better at this. Uh, They'll, they'll be a microsecond faster at avoiding collisions on the ice. Those kinds of things. They, they really understand that. And one of the things, we certainly have talked about the possibility of, of, and maybe this is something that can be done with the product as, as you develop it, is to have uh, 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 different team colors. So uh, Vancouver's playing Calgary, so, we, so we, let's have kind of the red, red objects out there. Yeah. And, and so bring in a little bit of that specificity. So I'm sure products will develop over time where you can simply change a red to a green to a blue, or whatever. Yeah. Well, we're getting there, but yeah. we're not, not quite there yet. Yeah, but that's the kind of thing. Uh, and then you can maybe, instead of using balls, the, you know, the animation may be uh, something that looks more like a hockey player. Sure, yeah, it doesn't move quite as smoothly as yeah. the ball. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, you're dead on there. Now, when players start out, we know that there are gigantic differences between them in terms of their NeuroTracker scores, even though their performance on the ice could be pretty close together. Um, what do you attribute the, those huge differences in at the beginning of training? Oh, there's a number of factors. One is kind of familiarity with, the, with this kind of a uh, situation that they're put into. To, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and, and I think that, that familiarity kind of getting a sense of what's the objective of this that we're trying to do is a huge one. And there probably are kind of central nervous system processing skills that, that vary. Uh, you know, and one of the things I really appreciate, I like the fact that there is this variance. Mm -hmm. It would be, wouldn't be very useful if we had these highly skilled uh, athletes uh, trying to make the National Hockey League where there isn't much variance, for example, on how they score the first time around mm -hmm. or over time. So. It's great to have that variability. And I know uh, last year when we tried it, to implement it as a, uh, with all the draft choices coming through mm -hmm. uh, and see how they scored. And is there any relationship between the high scorers mm -hmm. and those who eventually make it to the National Hockey League? Are they the better decision makers? That is the question, isn't it? Now, based on a play, based on a player's initial skill set, do you have? Uh, are there differences in the types of training you would recommend, or the the order of operations, or anything like that? Not at this time, but because I never really kind of got into that detail of mm -hmm. of trying to refine it, the training part. But I found it pretty fascinating to find that uh, the best young eighteen year olds, in terms of decision making on the ice. Likewise, were the better decision makers in the cave. Uh, that was that. That was documented, huh? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. So it was. It became part of our battery in uh, mm -hmm. in decision making about who who may be the most worthy. Definitely. Now, would your training methods differ between being uh, you know preseason, in season, or out of season? Uh, we didn't. We we kept that pretty constant, uh, and just encouraged them to. Do it about three times a day, three times a week, I should say. Sure. Yeah. So you think, or would you say consistency is key? Yeah. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, we ought to talk about concussions for just a second. Um, you've obviously worked with athletes who've had concussions. Uh, do you think that there's a, a time in between when the symptoms of the concussion disappear and when and when the uh, the athlete is, is actually ready to, to play, or do you think that the when the symptoms go away, that that's about 
that that's about the time to start getting acclimated to normal activities? Well, uh, I didn't. I don't have enough data on all of that. But, sure. But uh, I'm more of a proactive individual. You know, right after injury, probably giving the brain some good rest. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a point of diminishing returns, I think, where you can be very passive. And so starting a slow-paced, proactive program to track without taxing the brain too much, I think it's useful. It brings me back to the days of when physiologists and cardiologists said, uh, you know, people with heart attacks just lay in bed and, and rest. <laughs> and then one day somebody asked the question, well, what happens if you exercise that? Oh. And so then the exercise became the standard protocol for heart attack people. And then they said, well, aerobic stuff is good, but never get into anaerobic work because for sure that'll kill them, give them a second heart attack. And so we tested that model out, and it was, we, they were wrong on that too. So uh, I think a similar thing may be happening with concussions, brain injury, uh, that we've taken the position historically, let's just rest it. Well, I think we can ask the question now, what happens if we stimulate it just a little bit after a period of rest? And uh, uh, I, my, my prediction is it'll be similar to the, to the heart attack data. That's uh, to rear, an excellent example to, uh, to kind of illustrate it. Uh, just last thing I wanted to ask about. Uh, so obviously, you know, you've told us uh, many times you, you believe in NeuroTracker, believe in the benefits. What do you think is the major benefit you would see on the field or on the ice? Uh, the major benefit, well, there, there are several major benefits, but one is kind of uh, um, having that split-second decision-making time to avoid collisions, which could kind of prevent concussions, but, but beyond that, it's making decisions of who, quicker decisions of who's the open man, recognizing a particular forecheck or recognizing a defensive formation, recognizing goalie position, um, that you can only get with, with this kind of specific training. Isolation. Yeah. Beautiful.